cost segregation study. Essentially, you know, you buy a piece of property, it's just like a house and some land. So mm -hmm. building you can depreciate. Yep. Usually you depreciate it if it's like a residence, uh -huh. uh, 27 and a half years. Okay. Commercial, 39 years. That's a long time. When you get a cost segregation study, what they're doing is they're looking at all the individual pieces of everything. They're going like, okay, there's siding, there's shingles, the structural beams. This is why this process takes this, forever and it's super expensive. There's certified cost, okay. cost segregation firms okay. uh, that go in and, and do this for you get a report at it that says this is the breakdown of everything that's in there this is the tax life mm. that you can use to depreciate it it's going to be less for a lot of it than 39 or 27 and a half years so you're depreciating it over a shorter time which means you get those deductions early Hey guys, welcome to the Realize Gains podcast. I'm Stephen Tran. I'm an Oregon realtor and investor in multifamilies and short-term rentals. And I'm your co-host, Jordan Lee. I am a mortgage lender based here in Portland, Oregon, licensed in about nine states. Uh, I invest in single family homes as well. And who did we bring on the show today? Yeah, so we had Kurt Miramatsu. Uh, he's a tax professional. We talked a lot. Oh my God, we did a, a huge deep dive on taxes. Yeah, I mean, if you're interested in learning about taxes and just like the way that they intersect with the real estate world, um, this is a super great episode for you. Uh, Kurt's with a, a local firm, um, Gavin Mesher. Big, big, big firm, really well respected firm here in Portland. They trade you know, skyscrapers, but they trade big buildings um, and they do other businesses and everything. So he, he brings a lot of insight. We talk about 1031. We talk about um, cost Gift. segregation, cost seg, gifts, gifts um, and capital gains, depreciation, uh, all the things that are in interesting towards tax liability in real estate. So, um, yeah, there's this. If you want to take a deep dive, this is the episode for you. Yeah. All right. Have a good one. Hey guys, welcome to episode 55 of the Realized Gains podcast. I'm Stephen Tran. And I'm your co-host Jordan Lee, and we're super excited to have Kurt Muramatsu on the uh, on the line today. Uh, hey Kurt, do you mind just giving us like, you know, a quick background, tell us about yourself. Sure. You know, are you from the Portland area and kind of how you got into your profession? Absolutely, yeah. So uh, my family's originally from California, Southern California. We moved up to Oregon when I was two. Um, so born in California raised in Oregon. Long time Oregon. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Honorary, hopefully, at this point. But uh, I was raised in Beaverton. Yeah. Uh, went to Southridge High School. Um, part of a very musical family. Mm. So I play the trumpet. My two older brothers play alto sax. Mm. My dad played trombone and piano. Um, my mom doesn't have any musical talent, but she says <laughs> she uh, plays the radio, so that's good enough. For <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, that was most of my, uh, my education was going from band to band, any band that I could, jazz band marching band, concert band. And you, st you still play band. now or? Uh, I fell off a little bit. I'm trying to get back into a routine <laughs> of practicing and then maybe go join. I mean, I feel like there's options band. in Portland, yeah, right? Yeah, so that's the, that's the goal. So yeah, in high school, I was really good at uh, math, science, physics, that sort of thing. So it seemed logical, I'll just go do engineering. Mm -hmm. So I went to Oregon State, mm -hmm. um, did engineering. I did industrial manufacturing engineering, uh, finished my degree, did a couple internships and found out that, you know, in in theory, I really enjoyed it, but then in practice, it just, you know, didn't vibe with me. It wasn't, it wasn't what I wanted to do. It wasn't stimulating enough. Yeah, or it, it, yeah, I just, I saw my friends, you know, really into it, and then me not, not so much, and decided to pivot, went into accounting, so went to Portland State. They have this uh, post-baccalaureate program. If you already have a degree, you get in, get out in like a year and a half, just taking accounting courses sit for the CPA exam, and then you're in public accounting, so. Typically, we hear from people that like <coughs> go into engineering, they're like, oh, I, I don't know about engineering, there's not enough like people interaction, I mm. need to do something about <laughs> real estate, get into sales. Yeah. But you, you went from engineering to taxes. <laughs> um, yeah. Tell us what, what was the, why were you like, oh, no, nah, not engineering, I want to do tax, I want to get into taxes. What, what was the? Yeah, that's a good question. I think, 
You know, I did industrial engineering. So industrial engineering is like efficiency. So you are really dealing with people. Okay. You're dealing with people. You're getting their buy-in. You're, you know, mm -hmm. you're doing like collaborative events. Oh, okay. Where you're okay. trying to like, you know, doing kanbans. Right, right, right. All that like stuff and trying to like. Oh, so you might be more change. planning like big, huge yeah, like initiatives and like and let's let's try to you know identify our problems, fix our problems. Oh, okay. So in, in a manufacturing yeah. setting, yeah, which yeah. was the other part of my degree. Um, so I just, that part of the job, which doesn't really, you know, appeal to me, mm -hmm. is one of those things where it's like, I don't know if I want to, like, try to get buy-in from people. There's a lot of problems sometimes if you're, you're in that field. You know, upper management, you know, they hear lean, they hear... 5S, they're like, oh, we'll totally do that. And then you get in there and you're like, we got to make some changes. And they're like, oh, I don't know if we want to do all this. So um, that's something that I was kind of like, not really into. Yeah, I can see how that would be super frustrating. Like you're hired to make change, right. and then you're like, okay, here, like, here's here the, the change, and they're like, oh it's no, gonna be better. Fuck that. Like, we don't no, want to make any change. About this. <laughs> <laughs> that's not how we usually do it. Yeah, you know, that's that's the that's the hill that you have to kind of climb over to to get there. But like taxes is something that I was, you know, I, I was looking for jobs and I w just wasn't really happy with, you know, what I was seeing in engineering just because I wasn't happy with, you know, pra in practice engineering. Mm. Uh, and I saw accounting and it's, that's, you know, another numbers. You heavy. went from an extremely hireable <laughs> field to another extremely hireable exactly. field. Exactly. <laughs> and I was just like, well, let's pivot. Let's see if this uh, works out. And I started taking courses um, and I just, you know, it just really clicked. And okay. then after that, you know, you the the big question in, in accounting is like, oh, do you go audit or tax? Do you go audit or tax? Everyone asks you, do you go audit or That's tax? That's the main question. Yeah. It's not about whether you want to go into your own business <laughs> and like do right. small taxes or right. corporate taxes. Yeah. It's either audit it's like, or tax. Yeah, those are the disciplines. Like okay. if you're going into public accounting, those are the two can, disciplines. And so I, can you yeah. explain the difference between audit sure. and tax? So taxes is, <clears throat> is like compliance and tax planning and consulting. So it involves, you know, doing your tax return to giving you advice if you have a transaction, how do we structure this in a way that's beneficial or yeah. at least avoids pitfalls that, that might happen, or tax planning, which is, okay, we see that there's something coming up, an income event, maybe you, you want to like change your business, let's, let's project out how that's going to affect you know, the year or the coming years. Uh, audit or assurance, um, that's more of um, compliance on like financial statements or reviews or compilations so say you you want to like get a bank loan and it's like a sizable bank loan and they're like we really want you to have a third party audit mm. because we want to make sure that like you're you're doing good and we can trust that you're doing good because there's a third party saying like this is exactly what's happening yeah so that's that's that side of things and there's also other you know areas you can go to insurance like uh, forensic accounting where you, we kind of are like accounting Batman. You go in, there's been a crime. You're like, okay, what happened? How much happened? Who did it? You know that sort of thing. But um, and and from the audit level, it seems like there it's typically a specific size of transaction that's going to generate audit, right? Because every once in a while, I'll get a condition from an underwriter that mm -hmm. that it's like, okay, we can use this income for for the client's year to date um, if if we get an audited tax return and the mm. client's like, oh, no, we're not going to do that because <laughs> um, typically it's a pretty pretty big expense to have a, a, a real audited tax, a yeah. uh, real audited um, P&L sheet. Right. I mean, there's, so there's full audits. And, and sometimes it's mandated, right? And so right. So if you're, if you're like a publicly traded company, that's something that like you, you have need to, an yeah. audit. Um, if it's just a requirement, there's some negotiation there. So there's like a review, which okay. is a little less. They're not doing as much detailed digging. They're more doing like kind of like, okay, does this look right? And then there's varying levels of like, you know, assurance that you're giving people based on how in depth you want people to go in. Mm. There's agreed upon procedures, which mm. is something that's more of a case by case basis of like, okay, on this engagement, we just want to make sure that this number's right. And we'll set parameters around that, and it can be anything. Right. And the auditors will go in, and they'll they'll, you know, see like, okay, we'll give you assurance that either this number is, you know, more likely than not right, or we don't see any reason why it's not right. So, makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, real estate wise, when it comes to taxes, everyone <laughs> is interested in real estate for a various sure. number of reasons, and. I, we often get questions 
about taxes and kind of like, you know, what are the benefits and, and what are the things I need to be wary of? Mm. Um, you know, the, we talk a little bit in, on the show about 1031ing or, sure. you know, trading. Um, we get into a little bit about, you know, depreciation yep. and capital gains, those types of things. Just from the, like, broader perspective <clears throat> or, like, for, you know, from being on the inside, if, if, if someone was interested in talking about real estate mm -hmm. and tax with you, what are some, like, things that, like, right away you're like, oh, these are some things that people don't think about when it comes to taxes mm -hmm. in real estate? Right. Um, you know, I think a lot of people think of depreciation right away. Mm. And they think, oh, I'm going to do, like, cost segregation, or something. I'm going to get so much depreciation. I'm going to have on the deductions upfront, for on days, the front end, right? Yeah. But in reality, if this is – if you're – not a real estate professional in you know the sense that it is you know for tax purposes um, a lot of those losses might be limited mm. so it is kind of like structuring you know is this actually your profession and what are the thresholds you need to make that and what documentation you need to prove that you make that all right so for for our listeners costs cost segregating let's talk about oh, that sure. because um this this comes up a lot, and and people sometimes want to take advantage of it. You said mm -hmm. a couple of things that were interesting to me there. One, you talked about taking advantage of it early, which is typically mm -hmm. the the point of doing a cost segregation, yep. right? And then two, you said that you need to be a real estate professional because um, you get that I, when we do our taxes, right? We get that question about mm -hmm. how many hours do you spend yep. in real estate. Um, mm -hmm. So help me understand, like for a normal person that yeah. just works a W two job. Um, they work 40 hours a week and they do a little investing on the side. Mm -hmm. How the difference of how a cost segregation is different for them versus uh, someone like Steven, who's a full time real estate agent. OK, well, uh, cost segregation study, just in case, you know, these people are listening for the first time. They don't yep. know what a cost segregation study is. Um, essentially, you know, you buy a piece of property. It's just like a house and some land. So mm. what you can do is you can just say, like, well, it's a building and a piece of land. Building, mm -hmm. you can depreciate. Yep. Usually, you depreciate it if it's like a residence, uh -huh. uh, 27 and a half years. Okay. Commercial, 39 years. That's a long time oh, to wow, depreciate okay. property. Um, when you get a cost segregation study, what they're doing is they're looking at all the individual pieces of everything. They're going like, okay, there's siding, there's shingles. Oh, wow, there's okay. The structural beams. This is why this process takes these, forever and it's super expensive. And it's, it, they're <laughs> certified. They're certified cost okay. segregation um, firms okay. uh, that go in and, and do this for you. And they get a report at it that says, this is the breakdown of everything that's in there. This is the tax life mm. that you can use to depreciate it. And it it's going to be less for, for a lot of it um, than 39 or 27 and a half years. So you're depreciating it over a shorter time, which means you get those deductions early. Okay. Certain property would be eligible for bonus depreciation. Okay. So that's something that in the last few years, bonus depreciation is... You know, if it's a tax life of under you know, 20 years and it's using the, um, you know, regular makers depreciation, accelerated depreciation that okay. is available for taxes, um, you get to write it off uh, 100% um, until this year. Got it. And this year it steps down to 80 and then 20% and 20% until it's gone, unless they decide to renew it. Um, so, but that in the past several years has been a huge benefit. 100% write off of certain property that's qualified. Wait, you're saying that they changed the rules on cost segs to make them not as as, as valuable? No, the bonus depreciation was always around. Oh, okay. It was 50%. I mean, it's it's fluctuated across the years to incentivize certain Oh, but then there's just the, like how they changed the right, level of capital gains or right. whatever. They it's a, mm -hmm. it's a the, that element of cost yeah. seg gets changed. So, it's it's not cost seg in, in particular. It's any property that you buy that's mm -hmm. new that mm -hmm. qualifies I see. for bonus depreciation. Um, you, with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, went up to 100. Okay. 100%. So highly incentivized. Highly Suddenly incentivized. Suddenly, cost seg became a lot more popular. Yes, exactly. Interesting. Um, and <clears throat> now that's stepping down, 80% is still a lot. Yeah. Okay. But, you know, next year it's going to be 60%. Next year it's going to be 40, 20, and then it goes away. But, you know, a lot of times things go away, but not, you know, people don't want that to go away. So a lot of times it gets renewed. It might not get renewed, but right. we'll find out. <laughs> um, so only like real estate professionals can take full advantage of that full 80% or? Like it's not necessarily that, it's that you have losses. Yeah. So when you have losses, there's a bunch of limitations that you have to get through to be able to take them against all your other income. 
So if you have, if you're just a passive investor, for example, mm -hmm. you run into something called the passive activity losses, which means that you can only offset your passive losses with your passive income. Okay. It's all like segregated. So if you have a W-2, right. that income, you can't use the losses to offset Yeah. That. yeah. So for example, let's say mm -hmm. someone made $100,000 of W-2 income and right. then they made $50,000 from in passive investing. Right. The most that they could ever offset would be that 50000 They can't do their 100 and their 50 together, right? Right. So it would be you have your W-2, <coughs> which is a uh, 100000 yeah. You'd have this loss that would carry forward right. if you had you know, a, a gain on one year of activities or you had you know passive activity income in the future you could use those losses that carry forward they mm -hmm. offset that income whereas if you were a real estate professional yes. and all of it that you could do that whole 150 you could offset that all theoretically with a cost seg theoretically the, I, I mean, mean <laughs> I, you just with, have more opportunity yeah, you have more opportunity to take advantage See, it's of very it. yeah. it's you're you're able to use it a lot more yeah i was gonna say i feel like i might have depreciated too much and brought my income mm. down too low one year because it was like it looked great on my tax bill getting my tax return yeah. but obviously help uh didn't help me qualify so how do you find that kind of balance of how much to depreciate if you always like maximize it or when you're working with clients or how does that work i you know i mean i guess i'm always going to say it depends yeah. <laughs> it depends on you know all the situations because there's well, one factor that could change everything let's just say i, I want to make us like i'm a real estate professional okay. this is my full-time job mm. i obviously can have appreciate a lot, I, yeah. but I want to have a base salary of 75. Is there just a point you can just decide to stop there and depreciate only to that? So no? bonus depreciation is something you can elect out of okay. for a year for a certain class of property. So you can, oh, there's some flexibility. <clears throat> it's, it's something you can do. Um, there is section 179, which is another type of expensing for very specific property. I think you have to really be in more commercial space to be able to take advantage of that fully. Um, but that um, that you can actually go to the dollar. You can be like, I want to just do this much depreciation. Okay. But you can't create a loss with it. So that's okay. why bonus is so more beneficial is because you can create losses with an inactivity with bonus depreciation. With 179, it's limited to just the income you have to offset. Right, so if you had a, a rough venture and then mm -hmm. you, had a, you were showing a huge loss, like you could theoretically have a big negative amount. Yeah, for like bonus depreciation, yeah. you could really depreciate a lot and create a big loss. But then after that, it's like, okay, where does that loss go? Is it get hung up on passive activity loss rules? Mm. There's, you know, considerations as far as like, do you have tax basis in this investment? And that's limited there. Do you have at risk basis with your investment? It's limited there. Do you have, um, you know, there's something that came out. It's the excess business loss limitation, um, which is it limits your business losses to, I think, uh, coming up, I think it's like for Mary Finally jointly, like five hundred seventy-eight thousand. Okay. Okay. So you can't. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Um, so, fr from at a higher level, doing a cost segregation, you're thinking, the question is, is my tax liability this year mm -hmm. much higher than it will be in? you know, the coming years or when I sell it? Is that kind of the the sort of gamble that you're making if you're deciding to, to pay the money and take the time to do a cost seg? Yeah, I think I think that's a uh, like a planning tool. It's, like, it's right. something that you can do. Like, I'm going to sell a building. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to exchange it. I'm going to take the gain. Right. We're going to recognize gain. What can we oh, do? Oh, so it's typically, right, like you said, it's typically done when you don't choose not to do a 1031 exchange where you're deferring the taxes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you can do a 1031 and a cost seg in, in tandem. So oh, that's could something do that, that a lot okay. of people do. Right. Um, but this is just a tax planning tool. Right, right. I, I know I'm going to have an income. Plan. I see. What can I do to offset that? One of the things that you can do is do a cost seg on maybe one of your other properties mm -hmm. and see if you can take advantage of an accelerated depreciation. I see. Um, in that year. So one of the many tools in the arsenal to, yeah. like, strategically lower some mm -hmm. of your tax liability in that current yeah. moment. Or sometimes you want income. Like if you, you're going to do a cost segregation so you know you have like a lot of losses coming through. Yeah. Maybe it's time to get out of that building that you've wanted to sell. Right. It's looking really attractive. You know? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, you know, it's funny. I was sitting down for dinner or for lunch with a buddy from college that I hadn't seen in a while. And we were talking about real estate, of course. And um, he mentioned that his 
his tax advisor, which I had never thought of doing, told her to not do any of the depreciation up front or during while she owned the property. And then when she went to sell it, um, she depreciated it all at once. It's like a, what is that called? A reverse cost segregation or something like that? But it kind of, it helped mitigate her um, capital gains that way when she went to sell it. And I thought that was that was kind of interesting. Um, I don't know if that's a, another yeah. like depreciation strategy that people employ, but I, it had never come. I mean, I you know when I do my yeah. taxes, I always put the depreciation on there because I want the income from the property bill, sure. but a little, a little bit less. But I, I thought that was an interesting technique okay. as well. Yeah, that might be just the like rate arbitrage there, mm-hmm. where it's um, capital gains. I guess we can get into you know capital gains rates are more favorable. The mm. highest capital gains rates is 20%. Right. It's maybe a little bit more if you're, you have, there's some additional taxes, like there's called the net investment income tax that mm. you may be subject to if you have a gain that, you know, is more of an investment gain than not. Um, but usually it's going to be 20% if you, it's like a business and it's, yep. it's uh, real estate. Um, if you take depreciation, that's offsetting ordinary income. Right. The highest rate for ordinary income is you know, 37%. Right. Um, so that is, I think, where the benefit comes in mm. is, is you you can take depreciation on it, and then when you have a gain, then you know you have some of the capital gain. The problem is there is depreciation recapture. Oh, okay. So like, the IRS knows that this is happening. <laughs> <laughs> they're, yeah. they're, you know, they know <clears throat> this is happening, and they they say like, okay, well, you took an ordinary deduction. Uh huh. So to the extent that you depreciated personal property. Uh huh. Um, which is anything, you know, not like really the building of the land or anything like that, but personal property, that's subject to depreciation recapture. Okay. Any gain to the extent that you took depreciation on that personal property, that's ordinary rate. Okay. Um, if you have a building and you take depreciation, accelerated depreciation over regular straight line depreciation, so like if you did bonus depreciation on some, you know, real property that was eligible for it, um, then you would have to do depreciation recapture on everything in excess of straight line. Okay, interesting. So there, there could be mm-hmm. some risk in that type of strategy. <laughs> right. It's it, it it kind of like is the benefit. What's the benefit really? Right. Usually we just say like a deduction now is better than a deduction later, hmm. um, in my opinion. But uh, and why why do you guys say that? Um, is that because rules change and? Um, you know, like you don't know what your tax mm. is going to be in the future, or it's just time value money. Okay, yeah. so deal deduction now. Just having maybe. just having the funds now yep. is better than later because of inflation right. and, and other factors. Right, that's that's the biggest uh, factor. But um, yeah, and so there's, I mean, if you have a building <clears> and it's just straight line depreciation, there's no depreciation recapture, but it is still taxed at a higher rate. So it's twenty five percent for what's called unrecaptured mm. um, twelve fifty gain, which is depreciation on real property, um, which is just straight line, so. And do you have any, like, speaking of depreciation, do you have any interesting, like, surprising stories of, like, how much depreciation, like, that you would just never imagine, or, like, companies that have done, like, strategies and business planning around it that would Mm -hmm. would surprise you, or ways that it impacts the, like, you know, the market in different ways that, like, the yeah. layperson like us just yeah. doesn't think about. I I think a lot, of, well, and also, like, just talk to contractors and stuff. Yeah. Um, it's like, at the end of the year, everyone's really excited to get their project done. You yeah. know, everyone wants everyone to have it rushing. done, yeah. right, so that they can write it off in that year. Because it's the calendar year, it's right? Ca- it's it has your tax to be done year. by I mean, the it's, ca- it's whenever yeah. your tax year is, but okay. generally for a lot of people, it's your calendar year. Right. But that's, that's something that I, I hear a lot or I see a lot is, like, a lot of stuff tends to get done, you know, there's a lot of pressure to get done by year end so that they can take the deduction on their tax return. They can start depreciating this this year rather than next year, especially with depreciation like bonus depreciation mm-hmm. going down to 80% next year. You could take 100% this year if you were, or in 2022 if you were, you know, finished by year end. So get, the, get those projects done, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's that's kind of what, what ends up happening. Uh-huh. Okay, interesting. Um, l- let's talk a little bit about 1031 exchanges. Mm-hmm. I mean, I know we've we've briefly gone over this sure. before. Um, it, you know, from in the very basics of of our understanding, it's like you know you you take a property mm-hmm. when you sell it, 
you can um, defer the tax instead of yep. paying the taxes at, at sale instead of paying the capital gains you can defer it mm-hmm. um, to the future when you sell or the next property. forever till you die right or, <laughs> <laughs> and, and then yeah and then you yeah, can send I mean, it to your kids and then they don't have to pay yeah. taxes right yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah so help us understand um, what are some like pointers for people thinking about um, these and and some yeah. maybe some just things that people don't know about with 1031 exchanges. Sure. Um, so 1031 exchange, uh, it's a just tax free transfer. 1031 is the tax it's code. It's the tax code. Right. It's also called a like kind exchange. Oh. Uh, um, <coughs> it used to be that property of like kind you could swap. Now yeah. they've really restricted to just real property. Yeah, I heard it used to be for like cows basically yeah, because cattle. you couldn't. It was oh, really hard to like put an exact value yeah. on it. So they. So you just swap for I didn't know that right mm-hmm. so I could I could have swapped a house for like a field of cattle it has to be like kind like kind so yeah. it's it's cattle for cattle yeah okay it's house for house oh so I, I could so I could do a 1031 exchange on like the cow I have, have at home for another cow you used to used, used to be able to, okay. to. Not, yeah. now it's not too long property. ago not, not too, too long, long ago, ago. It, it got restricted to just real property can I ask what is the most interesting 1031 exchange? Uh, uh, I don't, I mean, I don't really deal too much. You don't deal much. with cows? I, mean, I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I know a lot of people in my firm do, but I <laughs> I think there's there's one interesting situation where someone just like, they traded in their car or something like that. 1031 exchange is like, if it happens, it you do it. So that's what happened and they're like, oh, well, I guess this is a 1031 exchange, but I didn't think of it that way. But yeah. it, was, it was, so it was very easy. Oh, like a car for like mm-hmm. a nicer car? Like yeah. maybe you got a car that appreciated, like I have a 1965 Porsche and it's mm-hmm. gone up in value. Yeah, you and then in. now I can trade it in for a Lambo. Huh. But I wonder, so when they changed that to real estate, did that like decrease the value of some of those older <coughs> cars a little bit? I wonder. I don't know. <laughs> anyway. I'm not, that, I'm not a car guy. I'm a real estate guy. <laughs> that's, that's why I'm here. <laughs> but, but. Like kind or mm-hmm. in real estate, that means you can trade. You could trade your single family home into a hotel if you wanted to. Yeah, so there's certain requirements. Um, it has to be either investment or business property. Okay. So it can't be just like your personal right, business. Right. So you're not exchanging that. It has to be used for if you have a rental mm-hmm. or if you have some land that you're just Does holding it, for appreciation. Oh, it can't be land. It has to be land that you've rented out. No, you can be land. It can be investment property. Oh, so it can oh, be it like could be a land plot of land that you just held. All right, just to, for the appreciation, right, right, or just for the appreciation, exchange okay. it for something else. Okay, um, but yeah, what specifically were you? But you could trade it theoretically. You could trade it into an airport if you want it. Like, I mean, there's is there yeah. some sort of limit on the? It's real property is pretty broad definition. So it, it doesn't necessarily have to be used for the same thing. So I could have an apartment complex and trade it for a commercial building. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so it's it's pretty lenient on, on a lot of that stuff, but it just has to be a real property. Okay. And is there something about like in the terms of the financing that's on the property that has to, you have to carry over, you have to hold mm-hmm. a mortgage for a similar amount to? So with 1031 Exchange, there's this concept called boot. 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 Boot is bad. Okay, I haven't heard unless, that. <laughs> unless you want to recognize gain. So yeah. essentially it is if you have an exchange and you take money out or property that's not involved in the exchange, you've essentially sold part of it. And you have to recognize gain to the extent that there was gain or you received boot. Okay. So you can't take any proceeds, basically. You can't. Or you can and you can recognize some gain. Okay. Which is fine. But, um, yeah, so if you have an exchange, let's say I have... Uh, an exchange where I sold the property for a million dollars. Usually what you're going to want to do is exchange up. Right. So that you fully, there's no chance that there's any, be any kind of boot. Right. Um, what you're talking about with debt on the property is you can have mortgage boot. Okay. So if you have a property that you have a mortgage that is, you know, I don't know, like a million dollars uh-huh. and then it goes down to a mortgage that's you know, 800 thousand dollars okay there's two hundred thousand yeah, dollars two hundred thousand yeah, dollars go that's debt relief okay which is treated as if you know you you've taken something out that counts as a gain right so it, it doesn't necessarily count as gain you have to work out all the calculations you sure. have to balance everything in the exchange uh, to see if that results in boot mm-hmm. um, and, and ultimately gain right but 
uh, that is something that sometimes you know unintentionally we'll see. But like a quick a rule of thumb: you want to keep your loan amount about the same or higher. Yeah, yeah. You want to you want to be able to like a lot like exchange up usually trade you up, put yeah. a little more cash in, uh, or put a little more you know, <clears throat> debt in. More value, more debt. Right, just so that you're you're not running into that issue. Okay, and you know I kind of have a let's just say a very light understanding of mm-hmm. 1031 exchange, obviously trading up to bigger and better properties as your property appreciates. Sure. Um, but yeah, I still don't really understand the whole basically delaying that the taxes yeah. till death. Like where does it go? When do I have to pay it? Do my <laughs> kids pay for it? What happens? Yeah. So what you have is essentially if I have like, you could think of it as just like tax. If you have tax basis, say I have like a um, tax basis in a, in a, a building in land, a uh, hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. I sell it for a million dollars. That's nine hundred thousand dollars of gain, right? Yep. yep. I do a ten thirty one exchange. I exchange it into another property. Let's just say, for purposes of this argument, it's another property exactly a million dollars. Mm-hmm. Okay. So now I've exchanged into a, another property with that's a fair market value a million dollars. My tax basis carries over. Okay. So my tax basis in its new property that's worth a million dollars is still a hundred thousand dollars. So if you sell it, then that appreciation on the previous property. If you sell it, then you'd realize it then because your tax basis is so low. Yeah. So compared to if you just had sold and bought, if you sold it, you'd recognize immediately 900000 in gain. And then you'd buy a property that's a million dollars. You have a tax basis of a million dollars, you know, plus minus any kind of selling expenses. But that's where the gain deferral comes in is it's, it's stored in the basis. Mm. The okay. basis carries over. So and you have you to just keep it, a record of you that. You have to keep a record of right. it. So that'll keep adding mm-hmm. up as you keep trading up over time. Yeah, as you keep trading up, your basis just carries over and carries over and carries over. Meanwhile, you're exchanging up to, you know, uh, a million. Right, million, and you have to million. keep some ledger with the IRS so mm-hmm. they, they kind of know what you're... Yeah, I mean, you file a form saying, like, hey, this is the amount of gain that was deferred. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then when you sell it, then, you know, you know what your tax basis is now. It was It's very low at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, the gain deferral on death, that is because you get a step up to fair market value on death. Ooh, okay. It is, you know, subject to estate taxes at fair market value. The exemption is very high right now. Um, so, you know, if you had, you know, a property that's worth a million dollars, you only have a tax basis of 100000 There's a lot of appreciation on it, but you also right now have a lifetime exemption that's like 12 million yeah something crazy high like that yeah um so theoretically like if you had a single family residence and you traded into a duplex or and eventually into a quadplex during your life Mm -hmm. if you if you (coughs) sold it before you died and it was you you, versus kept continuing to for it and then just and then passing theoretically you could have less tax liability is if it went down to your children, is that what, is that the idea? Yeah, so when your children received it, they mm-hmm. would get that step up to fair market value. So now all of a sudden their tax basis in it is fair market value. Okay. Time of your death. So that's where the, the deferral and like the, the complete, you know, tax free nature of that whole structure comes in. Is you're deferring this game, you're deferring this game, you're deferring this game, and then you get a step up to fair market value. Hopefully your lifetime exemption covers the you know, the appreciation, the, yeah. the value of the property, uh, and then that transfers to your kids at, you know. The, the lifetime value. exception, how much was that again? It's like 12 million. Yeah, 12.3 12 or 12.9 or something. The tax code is it's just it's one, it's huge. one person. Yeah. You, if you, if you <laughs> run into that yeah. problem, you're doing, you're doing something right. You've, you've, you've done yeah. well, right? Yeah. It's like, oh, no, my kids had to pay taxes on, <laughs> yeah. on this. And I, I mean, that it is going down. I mean, it's still going to be like. But it's oh, going are down. they gonna? Yeah, it's temporarily. It? Uh, it's it's gonna sunset. I think after twenty twenty five. Oh, I didn't hear that. Um, you know, <clears throat> they may decide to to extend to it. Extend it, extend, yeah, right? Okay. You know, that's always a possibility. But a lot of people are. It's a it's a lifetime exemption for estate and gift tax. Yeah. So there is a lot of people that will. Okay, well, let's take advantage of this now. Let's you know put together these gifts. Let's start transferring the mm-hmm. wealth using up this exemption so that when it you know drops, then. You didn't miss out on anything. Um, I, I want to talk more about mm-hmm. gifts later because I do get a lot of questions about that. But I, before we get off of the 1031 sure. s- subject, 
There's also some other things about 1031ing. I've heard about mm-hmm. a reverse 1031. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 that sounds complicated based on yeah. the way you you, you, you looked work? at that. It yeah. is. It, so, so it's ju- is it just like way harder to execute? I had to do one this year. Yeah. Uh, it's it's more complicated. Um, it's essentially in a normal exchange, a normal deferred exchange is what mm-hmm. it's called. You have a qualified intermediary. Okay. This is the person that makes sure that you don't receive any of the cash. Because as soon as you receive cash. This is cash, typically the 1031 exchange yeah, company. Yeah, yeah. This right. is, you know, first yeah. the American. <coughs> yeah. But it's, uh, they just make sure that you don't have received the cash. Because as soon as you have received the cash, you have boot, and right. the exchange just falls Interme- apart. Intermediary holding company, escrow right. or 1031 right. exchange exactly. co- company, whatever. So that's their service, is mm-hmm. they're just making sure that, you know, within the all this stuff happens, you know, you identify the property within 45 days, you, you know, close on all the transactions within 180 days, um, you know, you don't receive any of the receipts, um, they provide all the accounting for you as far as like, okay, what happened, and then we can crunch the numbers and figure out what the exchanges. So that's, you sell property, and then later you buy property. Right. A reverse 1031 exchange is the opposite. Hmm. You buy property, right, and then you sell property, and then you sell it out. Oh, interesting. Yeah. The tricky part is, and I don't remember what the acronym exactly stands for. <laughs> you have to have an EAT, which is essentially like a title holding company, okay, which holds the property while in the oh, in the you, interim. You, you don't put your name on title right away. You have <clears throat> yeah, a it's com- it's holding company ownership. Company hold it for you. Yeah, and, like just and, in yeah. case you don't do what you said you're gonna do. Yeah, I, it's it's basically the same thing except instead of money that it's escrowing, it's property right. that they're holding to make sure that you don't receive it, and then it's a sale, and then you recognize gain. But it's it's very complicated and it's more expensive right. on their part because they're they're holding title to right. property and you know that's <clears throat> there's some risk Definitely involved risk. there. Wait, so it's basically you're, you're, you st- you're still technically doing a regular 1031 exchange because you're holding the property in escrow under something else before you because you made the purchase earlier because you had the funds right mm-hmm. and then you do the selling and then you take title to the, yep. the property you bought mm-hmm. so technically it is a regular 1031 exchange at that point it's it's yeah after the fact like that's the result okay is a 1031 exchange gain deferral except you knew what you wanted to buy ahead of time and then you have to figure out what you want to get rid of okay which in some markets like you kind of you might be forced to feel like you have to do a yeah reverse. if there's like a really good opportunity right, right now mm-hmm. and you want to jump on it mm-hmm. then and you just you know you can't you know, find a you can't find a buyer in time. Right. You, then the risk would, would be, right, if you can't sell in time. Yeah. So it's 180 days mm-hmm. is the window that you can defer it. And 180 days means 180 days. That There's means, no, that like, means if it's close. a bank That's holiday, not in contract. if it's like That's in a not... weekend, it's like, no, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Can I delay one day of closing? Yeah, it doesn't matter. <laughs> if it's like Christmas Day, you know, at 11.59, it has to happen. So oh, That sounds like it could be very stressful. <laughs> Which is why you have like the qualified intermediaries and these companies that do this for a living, because then they know, you know, exactly how to comply, exactly to make sure that you're doing all the things that you, oh, yeah. you need to do, just so that you don't, you know. I mean, because some of these people up. are doing it on buildings that are like hundreds of millions of dollars, so you yeah, need... and they bought them in like 1919 for right. You know. So if you make a mistake on that, the tax liability goes from just. Is an astronomical Nothing jump. Nothing to yeah, yeah to thir- thirty five million or mm-hmm. more, right? Yeah. So that that could be like a a big whoopsies. Yeah. <laughs> you want to you want to make sure that you you know what you're getting into. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you could always write your contract instead of just buying it. Maybe make it contingent on selling your own property. But then in this market, who knows? Mm. But that's that's tough. I mean, it's like you have to buy it. We're not going to wait for you to sell your property. <laughs> right. Sometimes that happens. <laughs> so do it, but yeah. Just interesting ways to. Do you know how much more it costs? Like, and just let's just do it in terms of scale. Is it like twice as much? It's a lot more. A lot more. It's a lot more. I okay. mean, like exchange, regular exchange, man, like a couple thousand dollars. Yeah. For a regular exchange, for like a reverse exchange, we're we're like ten thousand okay. dollars more. Significantly, significant yeah. more expense. <laughs> yeah. And and are you seeing so for your clients, your real estate investors, how often when people are selling, is it just like? Nine times out of ten, they're doing 1031s, or is it more 50-50, or? It depends. So I, some clients, that's they really like to do that. They're, they're just, it's not even a question. They're like, they're just, this well, is what we're doing. 1031 exchange, yeah. let's just keep doing this, yeah. you know? And a lot of it is, is not necessarily that they're, like, 
doing it to defer gain or I mean they're doing it for gain they just want to like change their portfolio mm-hmm. yeah. sometimes it's like you know if your portfolio is really spread out and you're like you know in, in Texas in Alabama in California in Oregon mm-hmm. maybe you just want to like let's just concentrate on Texas make it easier to manage yeah but not have to it, pay a bunch right. of taxes so let's start exchanging things mm-hmm. into Texas or if you you know you have you know rental properties and commercial properties and you're like I don't really want to do commercial properties anymore so that's something you're like, okay, let's exchange into some rental property. Then we're only dealing with rental properties, and that's just easier to manage. Um, there, I will say, <laughs> we mentioned California and Oregon. There are some states that if you exchange out of the state, they want you to know that they know that you sold property there and are deferring the game. So every oh, year from California, if you exchange out of California, you have to file a, a like kind exchange informational form saying like hey we did this okay oh. and if we sell it ever that gain that we deferred we owe california for that oh, okay oregon so, is similar i think there's only like four states yeah, that do that to but, clarify all these things we've been talking about yeah. so far are federal but then there's also some state overlays mm-hmm. with these right <clears throat> i mean what do the taxes look like on that if you're exchanging out of those states is it like oh like what is the rate on that um, I mean, it depends on the state. Yeah. It's just their state income tax. Oh, so California, 13%. Oregon, 9-ish nine, nine, percent? 9, 9.9. Yeesh. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Don't thank God I live in Washington. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, good. So anything else, like, we should just be, like, any other creative strategies or things you can think about with 1031 that, like, you that's mm. come across your desk that it's like, oh, I never thought about that or... Um. Hmm. That's a good question. Uh, I think the thing that we see a lot is the exchange and then a media cost study. Hmm. Um, you, so the, com- you know, the combination, the combination, of those two can that's, be really powerful. that's very powerful. Yeah. Um, so that's what I see a lot. Um, Ten thirty one exchanges into you, know, you can you can exchange multiple properties into one property. You can exchange you know one property to multiple properties. So if you're looking to like maybe consolidate, if you you know. You're, you're looking to exchange up, but it's like you don't want to put that much cash in. Mm. Well, you can sell a couple of properties and get into oh. one property. Yeah, right, right. Um, there's, you know, you can exchange into all kinds of interests. So there's, you can exchange into <coughs> tenancy and common mm. interests. So it, mm. it, oh, it so real you can property do it with partners, like, too. Yeah, and you can, um, you can exchange a lot of interests in real estate that you wouldn't necessarily think about when you're thinking of, like, a, an interest what? in real estate. When, when you're saying you could do it with partners, let's say your partners don't want to sell. I just want to get out. I have a 50-50 partnership, and I want to get out of that, and I want to exchange mm-hmm. it to my own property elsewhere. Would that work, or is there, or you have to do it together with your partner? I There's ways to structure it. I'm, I haven't dealt with this before. I know people that have dealt with this mm, before. Yeah. But there are ways to structure it so that it, it's okay. Um but he, that's one where you have to be careful about. It, it gets complicated in that case. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm not. I'm not the best to speak to that particular transaction. <clears throat> uh, it depends a lot on that. You know, facts and circumstances of the transaction. But that is, it can be complicated. Yeah. Well, well, let me throw out an example for you. Let's just say we have a listener who has had a house for like mm-hmm. ten years. They're single family rental. They bought it in 2010 for like two hundred thousand. Now it's seven hundred thousand. Okay. Um, they they obviously have tons of equity in the property. They've never done a 1031 exchange. Mm-hmm. They're interested. They have, they want to upscale to the next thing. If they were to walk into your office, what would you need from them to kind of get started? Um, I guess we'd need uh, you know buyer statement, purchase statement. Okay. Um, the exchange company will give you an accounting statement, mm-hmm. which basically says these are the funds that came in, any interest that you earned on it, any exchange fees that we took out of it, and then the money that went out to the closing costs. Okay. So that's the bridge between one closing statement to the other closing statement. And then there's a whole bunch of other stuff on the closing statements. I'm sure you guys are well familiar with closing statements and there's just like a hundred items on yeah. there. Yep. We have to look at each one of those and figure out, what, yeah, <laughs> figure out what is it's like, okay, there's rent prorations and then there's escrow funding and then there's the loan and all the loan fees. So all that goes in the comp- uh, computation to figure out if there's boot 
number one. Mm-hmm. And also, what's your basis in the new property? Because mm. if you put additional money in, you get additional basis. So you get your carryover basis, tax basis mm. from the old property. If you put additional <coughs> money on top of that, that's more tax basis. That's new tax and would basis. you say that people commonly bring in money on 1031s? Or Yeah, I mean, it's you're never going to have my example of a million dollar property for a million dollar property. Yeah. That's incredibly rare. So there's always money going in, money going out, and there's always, you know, prorations. There's, yeah. you know, operating expenses that are accrued and, and, and due to the other party um, that that necessarily wouldn't happen where you would either need to put more money in or yeah. you're taking money out. And at that point you're risking recognizing gain. Okay. Mm. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, because I, I, I know I've never done 10, a 1031 exchange. I always talk, you know, whimsically of potentially <laughs> doing it at some yeah. point. But like I said, I, I'm like a little scared of the process. It seems intimidating. Uh, but obviously, this is why we pay people lots of money to do it for right. us. Right. And that's, that's you know, the, where the qualified intermediary comes in. They're, they're going to know, you know, exactly the timelines that you need to do, you know, like exactly what you need to do. Yeah. They're going to record everything for you so that when you give it to, you know, your tax professional, that they can, you know, figure out what the result is. Um, so that's that's kind of the... Yeah. I mean, I need a, I, I would need yeah, help yeah. with somebody to tell me, like, this is how much equity I have in my property if I were to sell it. How much can I transfer over to the next property? What, you know, how much down would I have in this next property? All this mm-hmm. stuff, which I'm kind of, like, a little <laughs> overwhelmed with. So. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a, you know, a more advanced transaction, Yeah, I would say, just because there's, there's a lot of, like, things that you have to do to qualify for it. Yeah. But... Um, it's available. And it's a it's a very powerful tool. Yeah, what I've seen the most from my clients doing is they're pretty much just taking all of the proceeds, putting it into the next transaction. <coughs> right. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. On the small scale stuff, that, yeah. and then probably having to put a little bit more in. Sometimes, mm-hmm. yeah. sometimes turning one into two. So. Yeah. Um, and you know, in this current interest rate market, I mean, are you seeing people doing these exchanges regardless? Does it does it make a difference if interest rates are higher or lower? I mean. If a transaction makes sense, it makes sense. I'm yeah. not here, you know, as a tax person making business decisions or anything like that. <laughs> uh, I'm only here to tell you what will happen yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you do it a certain oh, so, way. So you're saying you don't advise on whether or not um, it's a it's a good business decision. Yeah, I mean, you just tell them about what your tax liability is. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can tell them like, hey, you know, this is your your whole situation. This is what's going to happen. And are you, you know, is that okay? Mm. You, it could be okay because this is a great opportunity to exchange it to something else. Right. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't necessarily know that there's anything particular. I mean, would you I say mean. with the housing market kind of slowing down mm-hmm. with our interest rates going up that your business is slowing down in terms of t- doing 1031s, or is it uh, just consistent throughout? I would say transactions are down okay. just because of that. Um, I think that's probably you guys seen that a little bit. Oh, I mean, for sure. Yeah. yeah, so there's just less <laughs> 1031 exchanges. Because, I mean, why would you want Let's just say, I mean... We've had we have the worst rate since like twenty twenty mm. uh, two thousand uh, two thousand basically right now right and so why would you exchange for a super low rate to a would be for investment like eight and a half Jordan sure I mean yeah the question is whether or not um, it makes sense right yeah, exactly yeah. yeah I mean you know you're not gonna sell your <clears throat> your current mortgage for one that's way higher if it's the same house and its cash flows less like you know you wouldn't do that but yeah there could be opportunities where it could make sense as you're turning residential into commercial or getting more units or getting more opportunity for equity right oh yeah like i said i'm totally clueless about 1031s and how often they happen and (laughs) if it if it matters on the market so it just it does make sense Well, well and i think another it's just incentivizes people to to trade right yeah it gives you a deadline like, it, mm. and it also gives you an opportunity, like, to, to avoid taxes, right? So it, it yeah. makes trading a little bit, because no, like you were saying earlier, if you wanted to consolidate your portfolio, yeah. if, you had, if you had places all over the country right. and you wanted to consolidate that, but then you were like, oh, God, I can't do that because now I have to sell all of these and then I have to pay taxes on all of them. That's right. just going to be a huge headache. But if you can do it as a 1031, then you can just, yeah. you know, put it all in the same pot and then worry about it later. Yeah. It seems a lot easier. It's, it's game deferral, but at the end of the day, it's a tool. It's it's flexibility because, yeah. you know, you can you can hold real estate and, you know, that's not you, – you can't really employ that. You have to just stay there or you can 1031 exchange and do something else. So it's, it just provides that. It makes trading easier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, well, that's great. I mean, I, I learned a lot there. Um, we t- we started talking about gifts mm-hmm. really recently, and first of all, how 
if, if you if you run into that a lifetime gift exemption, you're doing all right. You've, you've done yeah. something good in this yeah. in this life. Twelve million, right. six million. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, so, just some really quick questions mm-hmm. for you, since I I get these questions all the time. Um, if if my uh, okay, I'm 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 buying a house for the first time. If my dad gives me a gift, do I have to pay taxes on the forty thousand dollars he gave me for down payment? No. You, you, the receiver doesn't have to. Receiver pay. never has to worry about tax, yeah. right? If you, if you give a gift, then you have to start looking at the gift tax rules. And and so I heard that <laughs> this is the other the next yeah. question number two that I always get. <laughs> well, I, Mr. Loan Officer, I hear that when I when someone gifts more than ten thousand um, dollars, they have to like pay taxes on that. How mm-hmm. how, how does that work? So. Everyone has an annual exemption mm-hmm. per like person, per donee, mm-hmm. per year. Right. So which what is the annual exemption now? Is it like it's seventeen thousand? Seventeen thousand. Oh, yeah. perfect. Seventeen thousand. So it's pretty it's pretty, you know. I did gifts for my sister for like sixteen thousand. So yeah. yeah. Hey, oh, and, hit it. Yeah. And what that means what that means, right, is that it's not subject to gift tax. So you don't even have that. to tell you don't have to tell the IRS that I gave my my daughter seventeen thousand right. dollars. Yeah. So technically, if Stephen and I were married, we could give our both of us could give our kid and their wife each seventeen thousand dollars. So that's seventeen times four. Spousal gifts are. Yeah, I like that completely. we're married. <laughs> yeah. Spousal gifts are completely exempt. Right. You can transfer. Them. No, oh no. So I'm saying if if our, let's say like I had we we had a kid that mm-hmm. was buying. Oh, you could both. We could yes, both you give can, each yeah. of them. Oh, interesting. Seventeen thousand. So each you could do individual. seventeen times thirty-four thousand. Okay. Yeah. No, seventeen times four. So that'd be mm-hmm. no seventeen times two. There's two people, right? But I could give him and her, and he could give. Oh, him if you and have her. two kids. Yeah. yeah. No, 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 the the kid and their wife and their. Oh, and the their, kid and their, their spouse. spouse. Okay. Right. So you could go up to. Sixty-eight thousand oh, really? dollars without ever saying anything. Oh, okay. Is yeah. that is that really <laughs> the case? So it's more, I can go give more than seventeen thousand. Uh, you can give it to a different person. You can give seventeen thousand to your kid, and yep. you can give seventeen thousand to your <clears throat> kid's wife. And this it doesn't have to be a immediate partner. family either, right? Like I feel like I've gotten gift funds from cousins and all this stuff, so I can yeah. just kind of give money it's everywhere per person, per, per person. individual that you off the street decide to give ten thousand yeah. dollars to. So that's yeah. and that's why wealthy folks have set up a tradition of giving all of their grandkids $10,000 or 15000 mm. Like, I had friends in college that were like, oh, yeah, I get $10,000 a year from my grandpa. I'm like, what are you talking about? That sounds awesome. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and then, but I think that's why there's this kind of myth that, oh, you can only give this much. Oh, it's just um, it's the predominant. And, and what they're tradition. doing, right, is yeah, they're, they know that in their lifetime, they're probably <laughs> going to have to give away more than – Thirteen million dollars, or whatever right. that that cap is. Right. So, starting early on, they're giving away the max every year mm-hmm. to each one of their each one of their descendants, yeah. so that they can um, slough off that tax liability in a in a in a pain free way. Yeah. So let's say uh, my kids they're buying a home. They need for whatever reason they need more than that max mm-hmm. gift, and um, I, I want to give them a hundred thousand dollars. Okay. Very generous. Do I? <laughs> thank you. Um, do I have to pay taxes on that gift? So it's subject to gift tax, but you have a lifetime exemption. It's a lifetime gifts and tax uh, estate exemption, which is, you know, twelve, thirteen million. Right so now. unless I've already given away, you know, that twelve million, whatever, thirteen million, right. um, I'm not going to get taxed. I just have to tell the IRS, hey, I gave my kid a hundred thousand dollars. Mm-hmm. Put this in your ledger. Yeah, this is exempt. You know, I use my annual exemption. This is the amount subject to gift tax. This is how much my exemption goes down mm-hmm. for my lifetime. Okay. Yeah. And then when it comes to estate, that's where your exemption is. So if you give gifts, it's reducing your estate exemption as well. Is, is that a different amount? Estate nope. exemption? It's, it's all kind of the same lifetime number. And if you give gifts, it both go down. Interesting. So okay. That's yeah, why so you, you've, yeah. got this, like, yeah. de- you've got this debit of 12 gifts that you can give away in yeah. your life. Yeah. And it's kind of up to you to how you're, when you're going to do it. How you're gonna, that's I mean, why I, I was saying you have people, you know, right now it's, it's $13 million. Let's, let's start giving gifts. 
use this up, and then if it goes <coughs> down, then it's not like they're going to claw that back or anything. Yeah, right. they've it's said that that's, they're going to they're going to be you you gave, you know, when it was at that limit, you know, when you do your estate taxes, we're not going to be like you did this and then yeah. So a great strategy it. right now would be find a wealthy person that needs to <laughs> <laughs> get rid of. I need, I'll just say this: I need to have these types of problems. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah, that's why it's why I'm like, oh man. 12, 13 million. <laughs> I mean, that, that's get, what I always tell my clients. Faster like, than you think if I mean. they're if you're like they're so worried about them <laughs> paying taxes, and I'm like, if you if you're paying taxes on that, like this is the good problem to have. Well, like, I, I think the bigger issue is probably state state taxes. Well, Oregon, can, is yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that difference? Yeah, yeah. Which is substantially lower. So, <laughs> but <laughs> like at the federal level, gift and estate are similar. Yeah, so they they are they're kind of like in tandem, where you have like this lifetime exemption, and it goes down and you give gifts. Oregon, like states, don't usually have like give. I don't know if any state has a gift tax. There might be like one or two crazy states. I, I don't know, but, but, I, don't, I, don't but know. it's California, yeah. <laughs> so they, and that's why but. they call it a death tax, right? It, <clears throat> like because it's like when you die, it changes things, right? Versus estate versus. Like I hear that, like oh, the death tax or whatever. Oh, I don't know if I heard death. Oh, you tax never, heard, you never heard that. that. We just election. call it a state tax. Yeah. No one wants to be happy. <laughs> no one wants to think about it. It's a state <laughs> tax. Don't well, worry cause, about cause it. it's like, well, if only you would have given it away before. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, for for states, it's it, the exemption is lower. Right. So a million dollars, you're probably going to hit um, fairly easily. That you, you can hit pretty easily. Yeah. Yeah. All Washington, it's like two million something. Like that. Oh, don't look at me. <laughs> <laughs> something like that. It's yeah. But uh, that is um, probably where you're going to pay taxes. A lot of mm. people will try to move to places that don't have estate taxes. Right. Um, and to do that, you know, you have to establish residency, and then um, you have to make sure that you know, <coughs> a lot of your estate, your estate is out of Oregon and Washington because they have the way it's set up is you might still have to pay estate taxes if you have property in, in Oregon or Washington, mm-hmm. um, based on how kind of mechanically that works. But yeah, and that's why people do a lot of different things with mm-hmm. putting their properties in different trusts and um, and giving away their money yeah. as they age, right? Yeah, the whole trust and gifts, that's a that's an area of specialization that I am not as we we have people for that. We have people yeah. in our firm that that's what they do because it's so complicated. Taxes, trusts and like tax havens and Art. I don't, I don't know. People put a lot of money in art because apparently it's <laughs> a good tax haven. I don't know. There's so many things. I'm just like, that's like another couple levels above <laughs> where I am at. If I'm thinking yeah. of that, you know. <laughs> yeah, but for like the for the average person, mm-hmm. um, typically, right in a in a real estate, if you're buying a primary home and you're getting a gift for your down payment, there's almost never a situation that either the person that's giving you the gift. Or you that's receiving it is going to be subject to any sort of taxes. It, se- it seems like to me, and in in ninety nine point nine nine percent of of these transactions, right? Right. I'm I'm trying to like think of situations where that would be an issue, but like I I don't I don't yeah. Generally, you're going to be fine. <coughs> um, yeah. Can, well, can I ask just for the layman who just like mm-hmm. you said has the one investment property or whatever? What would you advise them on their taxes just to make sure that they don't get it hit? Like, what can they do to prepare themselves to? be doing things right. You mean with estate tax? Yeah. Like, is there anything they have to worry about at all? Since it seems like those numbers and thresholds are so high that we'll... They're high. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little bit high. Yeah. We're almost there, right? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know if you had anything specifically in mind, but, you know, like I was saying, if, if the exemption is high now and you want to start transferring wealth, give gifts, give it use up the die, exemption, right? <laughs> and then... If it drops in, you know, twenty twenty six, I think is when it's gonna you know, it's gonna drop down. Then. To six million, you said. Yeah, six million. But you know, they might extend it. They might not. Or you can just do it now and not have to sweat about it. I feel like they'll extend it. I mean, you know, I feel like the tax code's kind of built on. I that. never know what's gonna happen. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's like it's funny. I made a, a tax decision based yeah. on that because like <coughs> I was did an, a, a, mm-hmm. a conversion of oh, a yeah. traditional IRA to a Roth IRA and did a taxable event because I was worried that they would get rid of that. They're, they called it like a little backdoor mm-hmm. thing where you could convert. Backdoor Roth? Yeah. Yeah. Because um, I was worried they were going to get rid of that, and they didn't. They didn't. Yeah. And yeah. so I paid taxes on it yeah. when I probably, sh- like, the market was high, so I yeah. probably shouldn't have done that. But It's like 1031 exchanges. They're like, oh, we're going to get rid of these. Yeah. yeah we're going to yeah, get rid of these. Yeah. Many and then yeah. they were like, okay, maybe, like, you can only defer a little bit. And then it's like all of a sudden it's like 
they're, they're yeah, fine. I swear, like, they, when Biden came in, they were like, oh, they're going to get rid of something in exchange. <laughs> it's like backdoor Roths, and oh, yeah. you're going to have to pay all your real estate taxes, <laughs> like, yeah. all the things that uh, sounded pretty terrible. But luckily, nothing, not much has changed other than, like, obviously this exemption to uh, this uh, cap from 12 to 6, apparently. Apparently. Well, we'll see. Yeah. I mean, most things in the, in the tax code are, you know, incentives that sunset. And this just so happens to sunset in 2026. Okay. Well, we will be watching. But, you know, it could renew. So. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So. Speaking of sunsetting things, you've mentioned a couple. One of them, you mentioned that cost segs were going to get a little bit worse. Is there anything other else that, like, real estate investors should be thinking about that are going to be changing in the next um, year or two that just, um, you know, if you have an opportunity to take care of it earlier rather than later might be advisable? Hmm. I mean, have you talked about opportunity zones on your... Um, a yeah, very, little, very briefly, little, yeah. Little, yeah. 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 Okay. So a lot of the benefits have lapsed. Mm. So oh, Already for opportunity Already for zones. opportunity zones. So there, there were five-year hold and seven-year hold incentives. Mm-hmm. But they all kind of converge on 2026. Okay. So you can defer gain up to that point. Oh, okay. But so it doesn't if matter if you bought it, it in yeah. 2020 or 2023. Yeah. You can only defer till 2026. Right. But there's like five-year hold incentives okay. or seven-year hold incentives okay. where you would be able to like completely exclude it. But that, you know, just how, you know, how time works. Yeah. Right. Because <laughs> if you buy point, it now, yeah, if you buy you it hold now, it for five you years, you won't be able to five, exclude. Yeah. Yeah. You can't hold it for five years. But it's still gain deferral. Okay. Um, it is still an investment that you can, you know, make if you have a gain. It's an option that if you take some of the proceeds <coughs> up to the gain that you recognize, you can defer it into an opportunity zone, which is a lot of rules and very complicated, but they have opportunity zone funds. So there's still some funds. advantages to buying an opportunity zone. zone. Not as much as there was a few years Not, ago, no. but there's yeah. still some That's still an option, but that is something that, you know, you can get defer gain up to 2026, well, but it's 2026. <coughs> yeah. It's going to sunset. I was going to mention, I think the Opportunity Zones came up in Tamiko's episode a while mm-hmm. back. So if anybody needs a refresher on that, they should check that episode out. Because I need a refresher. I can't. All yeah. I remember is that I was like, are any of my properties in t- <laughs> Opportunity Zones? And mine is literally across oh, the street from one. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, and I was, I, was, yeah. I was looking for if there is an opportunity. Well, obviously, an opportunity there to save on taxes, but I mean, do you want to give a quick explainer on opportunity zones? Sure, they're very complicated. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of rules. There's yeah. a lot of things that can go wrong. Um, so, it is essentially, if you have capital gains, so that would be you know regular capital gains from you know if you sold stock, it'd be if you have. Uh, Oh, yeah, it's not specific business, to real estate. That's right. Business gains from, you know, selling real estate mm-hmm. that is going to be subject to ta- uh, capital gains rates. Um, all those gains would be eligible to the extent that you have gained to defer into an opportunity zone investment. So it's it's only, it's not the proceeds. So if you sell a building for a million dollars and you recognize, you know, 500000 in okay. gain, okay. you can only take 500000 and invest it. You, you, only, you don't need to invest the entire million okay. to take advantage. You just invest how much gain you recognized, and then that defers it. Oh. So Steven's mm-hmm. company goes IPO this year, and oh, he has a, he, I <laughs> wish. <laughs> he, he has a big stock gain. Yeah. Um, he nets $10 million, <clears throat> and instead of paying whatever, what is it, 20% or 25% on, his, on that, I, I don't know what, how that capital gain would work. Sure. He can invest it in an opportunity zone and def- and defer some of those taxes. Is that kind of what you're alluding yeah. to? Yeah. Okay. But I mean, it's you know you don't want to get into it just because it's an opportunity zone. You want it to be a good investment. Right. Right. You know, there's a yeah. reason because you can still lose zones. a bunch yeah, of money. Yeah, you can still lose money <laughs> in any investment, right? Uh, but uh, yeah, if there's an opportunity. Uh, so to speak. So I had to put my like I'd had to purchase into an opportunity zone property if I already have one. If I didn't know, and you can. Like I said, there's, there are maps online where you can yeah. see if your property is yes. on an opportunity zone. If I have an existing one, is there anything I can do? I mean, could you build? You could you could spend that money to build something. There's a lot, <laughs> there's a lot of rules. Uh, <laughs> is the long and short of it. Uh, a lot of times, if you have opportunity zone property, um, it makes it a little more attractive to get cash infusions. Okay. Because then they're gonna get, you know, gain deferral on that. Right, right, right. And you can, you know convert a building, build a building, mm-hmm. you get all these funds in from mm-hmm. opportunity zone investors. Mm-hmm. So that's something that I see. Okay, interesting. People have an opportunity zone um, and then they 
you know, pour money into it. Right. They get investors yeah, that want to want to defer gain, defer their some yeah, of their. So it just makes it a little more got it. Um, attractive. The only my building was like across the street. Like, <laughs> I swear to God, like, I was like, is, is this count? It's right on the line. Yeah. Oh my God, when was, they were drawing the maps, they were just like, oh, nope, not Stephen owns this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was. Let's just say. Well, I, I still wouldn't have known how to, to obviously maximize that. I would have to go to an expert. But mm-hmm. I was just like, this sounds good. Tax deferral. Anywhere I can defer taxes sounds like a good idea to me. So, <laughs> you know. You know, speaking, we've we've covered most of the topics that I had on our list. Mm-hmm. But one thing that we, 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 and we've talked about a little bit, but I wanted to kind of just make clear as well. So we've been talking about capital gains. What is the difference in capital gain versus income and and when you're doing real estate, like where, how do those two like separate each other, separate from each other? So there's a lot of different categories of income. And depending on the category of income, it's what tax rate's gonna apply on a federal level. Right. Um, capital gains have a more favorable rate. Right. Um, if you have just ordinary operating, you just have rental income, mm-hmm. um, you have depreciation. Yeah, like own a rental property. Or yeah, or, you yeah. have a business, trader mm-hmm. business, and you're just you know operating. Yeah. That's just ordinary income. That's just income. straight up ordinary, ordinary income. Ordinary income adds to the to same the bucket rate. as your W-2. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If you have capital gains, that's a favorable rate. So if you sell your building, mm-hmm. Um, outside of any depreciation recapture, which we discussed earlier, right. outside of you know unrecaptured twelve fifty, which is a, a little bit of a higher rate, you're going to be you know, eligible for that capital gain treatment. So, like, I have an investment <coughs> property I've had for a few years or whatever. You sell yeah. that; that would be considered capital gains. Um, but what if, if you're flipping? It's different, though, right? Like, flipping if it's short is there is there short term? Yeah, short, short term, term versus is, long term. We yes. talk about so long term capital gains are, are eligible for that. And that's for holding for more than a year. <coughs> yeah. So that's like if you're trading stocks and you're selling options and you have your day trading, day, day trading, that's, income. that's short term. Right. That's, that's going to be subject to, um, and short term is taxed the same way as income ordinary is ordinary income, right? Ordinary income. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that, that's the highest tax rate. But if you've, you know, bought Tesla 20 years ago and or I said even around 20 years, I don't know <laughs> <laughs> if you bought it 10 years ago, as long as you've held it for a year, that's, Cap gains. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that's the difference between like basically like let's say ordinary income is thirty percent and then capital gains long term capital gains would be like what, twenty percent? Mm-hmm. Roughly. Highest rate, yeah. yeah. So that's I mean that could be a significant But sometimes sense. capital gains is even less, right? It depends on your income tax bracket. So oh, it's it's zero it's based and on fifteen your... and twenty. Okay. Um, based on your whatever they yeah, where your <coughs> yeah. income level at. Okay, got whatever it. Um, I mean obviously you know a lot about Saving on taxes in real estate. I mean, do you have do you have any properties on your own? I do not. You do not. <laughs> <laughs> trying to trying to get into that for the first time, but you know how the market is. I mean, you know, I feel like if you did have one, you you <laughs> you'd be the most uh, knowledgeable <laughs> person in terms of saving as much money as possible um, going into that. But yeah, what are your plans in terms of uh, looking for that? Have you have you had a do you have a a certain type of property you'd want to get into? Um, I mean, honestly, just home ownership. Yeah, you know, I don't. I don't have my first home, and at that point, that's a good starting point. Is just getting involved in the process, meeting with a, you know, mortgage broker. I mean, so, honestly, yeah. the market. Yeah, it's it's a little yeah. bit of a challenge for yeah. for some even a you know professional that's like you know working I and mean, you work at one of the top firms mm-hmm. in in the in the in the in the city in the state, and it's it's still like it's not entry level is these days is is challenge. I would say. Yeah. Like you have to, you got to be ready to go. You know, it's like, <laughs> yeah, and that's why it's like I'm, I'm gonna try to warm up. Yeah. To it. I'll I, meet, I'll meet with the mortgage broker. Let's see, like, what, let's, let's look at the process. Yeah. You know, let's start looking at prog- you know, properties right now. You know, maybe I put an offer on something that I, you know, I feel like, oh, I, I really like to live it, but like, you know, if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, I went through the process. Hey, that's a good attitude. And I then, like that. you know, and when I'm ready to go, when I find something I really want. I can really efficiently go through the process and, and hopefully have a little bit more. Of and so, when you buy a home, is it going to be? Are you going to be looking at it from from the tax side at all? At all, or is it going to just be like this is just where I want to live? It's it's going to be a hold. It's going to be just like I I'm going to plan to live here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because honestly, I I feel like I always and maybe this isn't the best advice, but I always tell people mm-hmm. like don't buy a primary home for like tax. <laughs> 
reasons tax like to yeah, lower your taxes. The, the main benefit of a residence is you get to live there. That's what, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is a good point. Yeah, it's funny because I don't have a primary home either. So. <laughs> yeah, like I mean, obviously we've talked about the tax benefits of real yeah. estate and, and different levels, different things and strategies you can mm-hmm. do. But for primary residence, I mean, the most it's, people yeah. you're not you're typically not going to do much more than the standard deduction, right? Yeah, you're owning property. Yeah, there's yeah the, the standard deduction so high right now, and and the cap on this state and local tax. But if you're thinking about it long term, it's converting that primary into into an investment property, right? Eventually, yeah. I you, mean, can, it's, you can it's, find you're ways in of, you're in the market, right? right. And you what have, and you what have equity can, you have an asset. And what's the uh, what's the exclusion? The huge exclusion for primary <laughs> residents? Uh, uh, yeah, it's like. Two hundred fifty thousand, five hundred thousand. Yeah, so you can exclude uh, five hundred thousand dollars to selling a home of capital gains if you're married filing jointly, right? Oh, and Mm -hmm. if you live there two of the last five years. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of like qualifiers. If you rented it and then you were made it a primary residence, then you're like, okay, now I have to do like math. (laughs) (laughs) So yeah, if you if you've done anything else with it. Yeah, you got to oh, check out those rules. Yeah, like, like if it, I, I mean, it doesn't knock years, you out. Okay. There's a whole bunch of, like, qualifiers where I, I don't know them off the top of my head, okay. unfortunately. Yeah. But it's it's like, you know, if you live there for, you know, two years of the past five years or five years of the past ten, I, I don't How know. How much of that about. time is consecutive? And <clears throat> right, yeah. There's but a whole bunch of that stuff. One, I mean, that's probably the the most used ex- exemption of in real estate, I feel like, for the, for the lay person. Probably. I mean... And it's, and it's a yeah. huge, it's a huge benefit. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, there's uh, that. The, what is mortgage tax deduction? Or, yeah, that's. Yeah. I mean, that's. Oh, harder. mortgage interest. Mortgage, mortgage interest. 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 Sorry. That's harder now. Um, is it? Okay. Just because. It's, okay. Like we were talking about the standard exemption is very high. Yeah. And they capped state and local tax deductions to ten thousand dollars. Okay. So now it's very hard to get over the standard deduction into itemizing, and then once you're above that. It's only like you think about it. You had a standard deduction, so your benefit is only anything that you got above the standard deduction. Okay. So now you're thinking about like, okay, so if I have a standard deduction of like twenty four, twenty six, 24, 24, 000, yeah, something, something around there. Yeah. But if you have like, okay, I paid you know property taxes in Oregon, so you're you're gonna hit the ten thousand dollar limit probably. Yeah. Uh, you have ten thousand dollars of taxes you can deduct. You have you know ten thousand dollars of mortgage interest you can deduct. I'm still not itemizing my. Yeah. And if you have, okay, you have that and you have, you know. You can't talk to a realtor over. about this because they, <laughs> they itemize everything. So I do itemize all yeah. 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 It, it, yeah, because it's different when you're, you know, you're self-employed, sure. yeah. But, yes, definitely. But for the, the, for the regular for W-2 regular person. For the W-2 person, yeah, it's, it's oh. hard to get over that. Um, yeah, what, it was nice with the, uh, the charitable deductions on, on the first page. You can deduct like $300, $600 in, during COVID. That it's was a huge benefit. A lot yeah. of people for the first time, they were able to deduct charity, which is crazy. It's, it's really nice. Um, what, I mean, what else, first of all, thank you so much. We learned Absolutely. so much. Yeah, thanks for having me. What, what else should first time envi- buyers, first time investors think about with, like tax wise, mm-hmm. um, aside from the kind of the things we talked about days, they're like, just a general mindset or mm-hmm. a thinking process that they should consider mm-hmm. when yeah. um, trading or you know investing. Yeah. I'm gonna make a plug for my profession yeah. here. <laughs> of course. Uh, it's let your tax advisor know. If you're gonna do something, let them know. Because a lot of times we uh, get to the end of the year and we uh, take a look at all their information and we're like, oh, you sold a building. Oh, that's good to know. That would have been nicer to know about that. <laughs> earlier because <clears throat> we can still do things. We can still do things. There's elections you can make with the return that yeah. you know, we, can, we can. We have options. Your options are limited. There were a lot of things that if we knew about that transaction during the year, we could have done some things you know, before year end um, that you know, could have helped out with that. We could have advised on that. Um, so I would just say, you know, if you're thinking about doing something, call your tax advisor. Just say, hey, how's this? How's this looking? Is there anything we can do? We should be looking out for, um, you know, if you just want to like get together every quarter, just be like, hey, here's here's what we're thinking about doing. Yeah, I, 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 will, would, I would appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> I will mention this: after I got yeah. my first investment property, uh, I could not do TurboTax anymore. I like I tried to like put stuff into yeah. there for my property. I was like, yeah. this is too much. So I had to go find a professional, and that helped mm-hmm. out a lot. And yeah. then 
he's also gotten mad at me for doing things that I, <laughs> you know, without <laughs> telling him or. We're not mad. There. We're disappointed. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, but, but yeah, I, I definitely recommend as soon as you get that first yeah. investment property or you converted your primary into an investment property, obviously yeah. contact a professional. Well, like, we're here to help. Uh, you know, don't try to just save money by using TurboTax or this and that. Like I remember comparing the two, mm -hmm. um, trying stuff on TurboTax and seeing where that number was compared to where I, what I actually got. And it was yeah. thousands of dollars in, in uh, tax return money versus TurboTax. Mm -hmm. So never went back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that's the the huge value in a professional, right? Is um, it's not just that transactional. Here's a few grand, do my taxes. It's it's, hey, here's what I'm thinking about doing, mm -hmm. and then how can I m minimize my uh, my you know tax liability, and and that's where the planning will actually yeah. save you money and time mm -hmm. over your career, and and help you avoid major pitfalls. I, I right. think, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I'll say this is, I, I know taxes can be overwhelming for a lot of people, mm -hmm. but if you're good at your taxes, you're good on making more income for yourself. It's literally can be thousands of dollars in your pocket if you are at least a little bit knowledgeable or have a, you know, a knowledgeable tax professional on your side. So mm -hmm. it's not, you know, like, I know this can be a little overwhelming for a lot of people, but hey, you know, thousands of dollars, that can buy you a lot or potentially millions of dollars totally, if we can yeah. get to that $12 if million you, dollar mark. Yeah. 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 So it's very important. So yeah. Thanks so much. Greg. Yeah, of course.